In this lesson, we're going to be discussing how and where to install your irrigation valves. The very first thing that we want to talk about is that every automatic valve has a specific direction of flow. Let's take a look here at a solenoid valve. I've got a Hunter PGV in my hand. And most solenoid valves, or all of them I think, have an arrow printed or stamped somewhere on the body. And the body is the lower piece here that gets glued in or um, threaded onto the irrigation main line. So on this one, it has an arrow printed on the top. You see the back side of the arrow on the inlet and the pointy end of the arrow on the outlet. So there's also another way for solenoid valves to be identified as the direction of flow. Pretty much everyone that I know of, and maybe there's some you know obscure valve out there that I've never seen that it's backwards, but when you look at a solenoid valve, typically the solenoid is going to be on the outlet side of the valve. Like I said, I don't know of any others, but you know I just want to put that caveat out there to, to always look and check your direction of flow just to make sure that you know when you're installing these that you're doing the right thing. I have run across valves in the field that were threaded on backwards or, or glued in backwards. So, so now if you're working with an indexing valve, also called a sequencing valve, it's a lot easier to tell, or maybe just as easy, it's not like it's difficult with a solenoid valve, but it's really easy to tell what the direction of flow is. The inlet is on the side, water comes in, and then water goes out through the ports on the bottom, pipes go down and on out to the valves. I'm holding a K-Rain 4000 and that also applies to the Femco who makes a great indexing valve. And there may be some other indexing valves out there that I'm unfamiliar with, but the ones that I see prevalent in the market, pretty easy to tell what the inlet and the outlet for the direction of flow is. Okay, so when we're designing and planning a system, the very first you know, decision that you're going to make is, should I include a master valve on the system? And what a master valve is, is a solenoid valve that's placed at the very beginning of the system, right behind your backflow prevention or right at the supply point source. And what that, ha what that does and what happens is when the timer turns on valve number one, not only does it turn on that zone valve number one, but it turns on the master valve as well. And the master valve stays open while the timer runs through the cycle of zones one through five or, or however many zones that you have. And then when the cycle is done, not only does it shut off the last valve, but it shuts down the master valve. So the purpose of this is to prevent a catastrophic loss of water in case of a leak or a break on the main line. So if this Master valve is closed for the majority of the time, you know, 23 hours a day or 22 hours a day that the system is not running, then you're not going to have that constant pressure pushing on all the fittings, pushing on the valves. And if a leak develops, then the only time it's going to be leaking is when the system is running. So, and when a system is running, it's only going to be under dynamic pressure which is generally less than the static pressure. Dynamic pressure is measured while water is moving. Static is when it's stopped. So when the system stops and the master valve closes, it does capture the pressure in that pipe. But if there's a leak, then it's going to drain down pretty quickly or squeeze out the pressure pretty quickly. Versus if you didn't have a master valve on there and there was a leak on the main line, then it's going to be leaking 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if the leak is on the back of the property or somewhere that's not readily seen, you could lose a substantial amount of water before you realize what's going on. And with a master valve, if there is a leak, sometimes you might not ever know it. If the leak is small enough and it's not under that constant pressure, it may not ever develop into a large leak. And I've seen ones before that it leaks that when the system was running, it didn't even actually leak because the dynamic pressure was less. So. That's our first decision, whether we're going to use a master valve, right? Well, let's talk a little further about that is that, you know, most modern timers have the ability to run more than one valve. So if we're using a master valve, we check with our timer, we, you know, open up the bottom portion of it that has your terminal strip and it's going to have, you know, the, the zone numbers numbered there, the common with a C, but it also may have a P or a P slash M marked on another terminal. And that means either pump or master valve slash pump. 
The pump means is that it can power a, a pump start relay, which basically takes this, the same amount of power to open as a regular uh, solenoid valve does. So that terminal is used to hook up for our master valve. One wire would go to that P or P slash M terminal, and the other wire would go to our common. So, you know, when we're looking at our specifications for the timer, usually most, you know, 24 volt irrigation timers are putting out somewhere around a thousand milliamps. And for most solenoid valves, it takes somewhere between 350 to 450 milliamps of inrush current to open that valve up. We've talked about this in a previous lesson, but it takes more energy, it takes more electricity to open the valve than it takes to hold it open. So we want to make sure that our timer has enough output to power two valves at once. And I, almost certainly if it has a, a P or an M slash P terminal in the timer, then it has enough amperage to open two valves at once. And also, you know, if you're using an indoor timer on the wall warp transformer, on the back of it, it'll list how much amperage that it's putting off. So it's pretty easy to check on that. So the second decision that we're going to need to make is where are we going to put our irrigation valves? Now we have two basic, basic methods available to us. We can either create a manifold or we can put the satellite or we can put the valves in a satellite configuration. A manifold is basically just our valves placed side by side in a configuration and if they're underground they'll probably be inside of a rectangular valve box. And for a regular valve box are typically 12 inches by 17 inches, you know, rectangle, and you probably want to stay to four or less valves in one of those sizes. I've seen more in there and unfortunately it doesn't leave you enough room, like if you're getting five or, or even six valves inside of the regular sized valve box, they're crammed in too close and it generally doesn't leave you enough room to do maintenance and repair, anything other than just taking a solenoid out and replacing the solenoid. So I recommend that you have four valves or less in a manifold configuration and you could put more than one manifold on your property. Okay, so one of the things that you need to watch out for on your valves, whether you're gluing it in or, you know, if it's a slip and you're gluing everything in or it is a threaded that you're using a threaded fitting to put it on, you know, you're going to have a T or an elbow off of the main line. Make sure that you leave enough room there on your, on your inlet and outlet side so that if you needed to cut out and replace a valve that you have enough room to do so. I see manifolds constructed to where they're, they're side by side right against each other and there's no room between the fittings. Well, that kind of defeats the purpose. You want to be able to take these out. And a, a lot of times, you know, if you're using a threaded version of the valve, you know, you can use a, a male adapter, which I don't recommend. I, I prefer to use a female adapter and a threaded schedule 80 nipple, usually a two inch nipple to thread that on there and then take your solenoid off and then rotate this on its fitting, take it out and pop a new one on. So that means that you need to leave enough room between your valves in the manifold so that it has enough room to spin off. I see them side by side and you, you, you can't take it off of the threaded fitting. So that doesn't make sense either. So just make sure that you leave yourself enough room in there to work. And when it comes to the wiring, in a manifold situation, unless you're a super long way away from the timer, you know, you can check there's uh, the specifications are in most of the manufacturer's books or on the website as to how far you can go with each size of wire. And if you're using a manifold, you can use a wire bundle, which has several wires encased in black plastic. But those are a little more difficult and sometimes people will run those wire bundles into a manifold and then just stretch the wires out and not give themselves enough room to where you can't even really unthread the solenoid. So make sure that you pull enough of those wires out so that you can have enough room and a little bit of flexibility in there to take your solenoids off and deal with them or whatever. Now we're going to talk about a satellite method. Now the manifold method is generally going to make you use more pipe, right? Because you have a central location of the valves and then the pipes have got to go out to each zone. So you're going to use more pipe, but less wire. 
And a satellite method is where we place one zone or one valve in the vicinity of the zone that it's servicing. So we're going to use less pipe, but more wire. And you're also going to have more pipe on the irrigation main line. And generally this is used, this method is used on larger properties, big commercial properties, and you're going to have a really long main line, but, and then you're going to use probably single strand wire to get out there, which is a thicker wire and you can go a, a farther distance with single strand wire. You got to check the specifications to see the distance and all that, but you're going to use less pipe for your zones. And you're going to find generally each valve is going to be in a seven inch or a 10 inch round valve pit or, or valve box. So the disadvantage to that sometimes is that it's easy, especially if it's just in the small seven inch round boxes, that it's easy for the grass to grow over it, especially if you're using warm season grasses in your area. It's easy for the grass to grow over the box and are harder to find. You might have to get out your wire tracker, your valve tracker to find them, whereas in a manifold configuration, they're in a large box and you can find it or you already know where it's at. Okay, so let's talk about the order of components in an irrigation system. We're basically talking about the main irrigation water line here. So we're going to start off from the very beginning, and that's your water meter, curb stop, well, or lake pump, or whatever it is that supplies the water for your irrigation system. The very next thing in line, and this there's two options on this, but the very next thing in line, if you're uh, local codes require a backflow prevention unit, such as this double check valve assembly here, it should be the very first thing on your irrigation system. National codes say that once water has entered into irrigation piping, then it's unfit for human consumption. And what this type of uh, backflow prevention unit does is to prevent water from being sucked back into the drinking water supply. It also prevents it from being pushed back into the drinking water supply should the lines be back pressured in some way, but it prevents that water from going back into your drinking water supply or back down into your well or whatever, right? The option on that is, is that maybe your state or your city or county requires anti-siphon valves and they don't like the double check valve assembly so then you wouldn't have you know your backflow prevention unit at the beginning then your anti-siphon valves which is your zone valve which has a uh, an atmospheric vacuum breaker attached to it that's going to be your backflow prevention unit and that's going to satisfy your local codes the next thing in line which is optional is a pressure regulation valve and if you have really high pressure at the source, you may want to consider a, a brass or a, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a plastic one, but normally the brass is a pressure regulation valve that you can set the pressure on it for the rest of the system. And that keeps, you know, leaks from happening or keeps water hammer down or keeps just from the parts from getting, getting wore out uh, prematurely from the excess pressure. The very next thing in line, and this is optional as well, is your master valve. And you'll want this at the beginning of the system. I've seen situations to where I saw a large manifold of valves and one of the valves was a master valve, which doesn't make really any sense. If you're going to put a master valve on the system, put it up at the beginning of the system so that you can protect all of the main line and all of the zone valves. And of course, it's going to take a little extra wiring to get up there to it, but that's not a big deal. And then you have your main water line, your main irrigation line that goes out to wherever your zone valves are. You got your zone valves and then you go into unpressurized zone piping, you know, that's only pressurized when the system is running.